Now on BBC One Northern Ireland, Kevin McGee has the second of three special spotlight programmes this week. The programme contains some strong language. Those are friendly. We'll be expensive, right? First impressions can be deceiving. These men may look like lifelong friends. But one of them shot the other, leaving him for dead. This is the story of how a would-be killer and his victim came face to face. This man is a Republican folk hero. He earned his reputation the hard way. At one time, he was the IRA's longest serving prisoner in England, spending more than 21 years in jail in a single stretch. I am a Republican. I will be a Republican to the day I die. I have the utmost respect for the IRA and always will have. But outside his own community, he's a former terrorist, a convicted would-be bomber and attempted murderer. This is the man Ronnie McCartney tried to kill. Malcolm Craig was an unarmed policeman when he was gunned down on a Southampton street. He was shot in the stomach at close range. My most vivid memory is of uh, the gun being pointed at me and this brilliant halo of blue and white light and this little black disc in the centre, which I'm absolutely certain was the bullet as it left the gun. Today, Ronnie McCartney is back in Southampton, three decades after first going there to cause mayhem and destruction. In the 70s, he was part of the wider Bogan Street Gang, a notorious IRA cell that brought terror to the streets of England in an attempt to force the government to the negotiating table. Now he's on a very different mission, one of reconciliation. He's there to revisit not only his past, but the ex-policeman he once tried to kill. Ronnie <laughs> McCartney grew up in the Lower Falls area of West Belfast. At the onset of the troubles, he was a teenager who had lost both parents to illness. In 1970, aged just 16, he joined the junior wing of the IRA. The reason why a lot of people became involved in the IRA, whether the official IRA or the professional IRA, there would have been more an emotional response rather than a political response. He actually felt that the community was under attack, and the only option that you had was actually to join the IRA to do something to eradicate that attack. At 17, he graduated into the official IRA and sided with the Provisionals when the organisation split. It was made very clear that your future within the IRA there was only two consequences on our brain or a prison cell. Like, you know, it wasn't, wasn't clouded, it wasn't hid. You know, you knew exactly what you were becoming involved in. Malcolm Craig is semi-retired now and has the time to return to the skills he picked up in his first job in catering. Born and brought up on the south coast of England, he opted for a career in the police. At 24, he joined the Hampshire Constabulary. In the same year that Ronnie McCartney joined the IRA to overthrow the state, Malcolm Craig began a career upholding the law. He was the traditional English bobby on the beat. A normal day would have been uh, walking around the town, um, chatting to local shopkeepers and anyone else that cared to stop for a chat. Um, fairly mundane, really. But all that changed. In 1974, the IRA launched a savage bombing campaign in Britain. No warning bombs ripped through pubs in Guildford, Woolwich and Birmingham killing 30 people and injuring many more. 
Ronnie McCartney was handpicked to go to England to reinforce the bomb teams already in place. We felt a, a certain amount of pride in you know, the IRA hierarchy would have the confidence in the Aussie to go down there for starters, right? We felt that the place where the war could be won would be in England. For him, this was the equivalent of operating behind enemy lines. After meeting contacts in London, he was ordered to move south. One of the IRA's tactics was to create the impression it had more personnel in England than was actually the case. So Ronnie McCartney was sent here to Southampton to set up an IRA base in southern England. His instructions were straightforward and ruthless. He was told to plan and carry out as many bomb attacks in the south of the country as possible. He knew he had to blend in, become an anonymous face in the crowd. With another man he moved to a bed set in Southampton's Westbridge Road. No one noticed him at first, but then the landlord got suspicious and called the police. One officer arrived and knew something was wrong. Well, the policeman asked who we were, like, you know, and I said, like, once again, I tried to speak with an English accent, which was ludicrous, like, you know. And then when I looked at him, he looked at me, it was just a body language, I knew the game was up. So the guy was sitting beside me, like, I just nodded to him, and he took a weapon, a 38 special, and put it on the, the policeman's chest, but he allowed him to run out of the flat. And then took another weapon from under the bed, which is a 357 Magnum, and first, the landlord was standing in the doorway. So I actually uh, pushed the gun into the, the landlord's stomach. But I didn't, just didn't feel like shooting him, like, you know. So I ran out of the flat. You didn't flat. shoot him? My well, nice reaction was to shoot him, but I didn't. Malcolm Craig was on routine patrol not far away, and it was him who took a radio call for help. He made his way to Westridge Road. I saw a panda car with two men standing and I definitely saw uh, one of them pointing into the car and this flash and then heard the report. Sorry. So I got over this. <laughs> um, and uh, they started running towards us, um, and I mean the immediate thing was this bastard shooting at my friend. I like him, I was running, I was up the side of the car, and getting back, and now uh, policeman got in the car and ran after us. They both turned, um, one of them crouched and fired two shots, and I went down. Um, I can only remember actually laying on my back in the gutter where I couldn't feel my left leg. Um, couldn't really feel my stomach either, but I could feel this pumping inside, so I knew I was losing blood. In blind panic, Ronnie McCartney and his accomplice, whose identity he's always refused to reveal, ran off. They then hid inside the grounds of a church. We went through thorn bushes. Tried to stay off the main roads, main streets. And uh, we actually ended up in a, a church with a graveyard on it. And uh, we stayed there for the night. He'd left a driving license behind in the flat. The police were on to him, but along with the other IRA man, he managed to slip through one of the largest cordons ever mounted by Hampshire police. The next morning, we get up, and you have to bear in mind that we're all muddied, where our clothes were ripped, our trousers were ripped. The person who was with me wanted to get a taxi, and I thought if we had to get a taxi, it would have been uh, more noticeable, and the taxi driver probably after the police were repaid for information would have revealed where we actually went to. So we got on the bus. I remember going through the town on the bus and there was roadblocks up. But we got through on the bus. 
surgeons thought to save Malcolm Craig's life. Ironically, being hit at close range may have prevented even more serious injuries. We've been told during training that um, some of the bullets they were using uh, were um, splintering on impact and causing horrendous injuries. I was really lucky to have been as close as I was because it just went straight through, went straight through my pelvis and I think had it been any, any further away then chances are my pelvis would have shattered and I would have been uh, at least um, disabled for the rest of my life. Ronnie McCartney escaped and made it back to Dublin but he was arrested a year later in County Tyrone and brought back to England. He was given three life sentences for the attempted murder of Malcolm Craig and two of his colleagues. I was quite content with that. The only thing that annoyed me probably was the fact that the other fellow that was with him um, got away. Ever since, Malcolm Craig has lived with the thought that he could have lost his life in the line of duty. Yeah. He was awarded the Queen's Gallantry Medal before he retired four years ago. Now he helps look after his eight-year-old grandson. While Malcolm's daughter Rachel and his other two children were growing up, he never discussed the shooting. Dad didn't want to talk about it, so nobody did. Uh, I never talked to friends about it or any other members of the family. And I think when we asked questions, if ever we did, you know, we were given an answer, but it was never taken into a conversation, really. Rachel was there when her father agreed to come to Northern Ireland to meet the man who'd shot him. Their encounter was one of several broadcasts of the weekend by the BBC and overseen by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Even 30 years on, Malcolm Craig found it difficult to think of how his family could have been affected had he not survived. To have been in this situation and to realise that my youngest child wouldn't even exist if I'd died that night. Um, and I think my tremendous loss that would be. I've got three amazing kids. And they love them to bits. I knew what you were doing, and that was your job. You know, we weren't doing a rap or anything like that. We were doing a job. Unfortunately, the first time the rap happened. But I'm glad that you had your child, and I'm glad you lived. And I'm glad you had three beautiful children. children have done last night all. Immediately after that first encounter, the two men agreed to have lunch together, joined by Ronnie McCartney's wife Anne-Marie. There's no animosity between the two families. Far from it. They get on with the business of getting to know each other and want to spend even more time in each other's company. They arrange to meet up later on for a night out in Belfast. 
uh, my drive part time. Delivery. Every now and again, while we were out, I thought, "That's the man who shot my dad. That is, it's just so mad." But it was such a long time ago, um, and I was getting on very well with Anne We just, you know, and Dad and Ronnie were chatting, and I think anybody else in that restaurant would have thought that we had known each other for a long time and that we were all just friends. And yeah, it was crazy and I did have to keep pinching myself. The contact didn't end there. The next meeting is in Southampton at the exact place where Ronnie McCartney shot Malcolm Craig with a 357 oh. Magnum. <laughs> Hi, Malcolm. Hi, how are you? Hello, Ronnie. Yeah. You're doing well? Yeah. yeah, good to see you. Hi. So this is where it's happened? Yeah. Was it exactly this spot? Uh, I, I can't make up my mind whether it was here or a little bit further up there. My car, I, as you came, you, because you started we, we, we towards me when we you saw there. me. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I ran the car up onto the pavement yes. and I stopped. I'm almost sure it was just this side of that telegraph pole. I think we fired before we fired you, didn't we? Yes. Yes, because I saw the gun flash yeah. um, as I came around the corner, uh -huh. and uh, uh, that's when the adrenaline started going. That's where you just instinctively got out of the car. Yeah. 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 You left there. Nothing courageous about it. It's just just bastard shooting at my mate, <laughs> and then you run for him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my prime intention was to run you down. Yeah. I make no bones about yeah. it, but I just wasn't going fast enough. Uh -huh. After the shooting, did you have any thoughts about what you'd done? To be quite honest with you, Malcolm, no, I didn't. My thoughts, like after the shooting, were to get away. Mm. I never really thought of the consequences no. of what happened to the person who was at the other side of the, the bomb. Mm. So what's it like for a victim to return to the place where he almost died with the person who tried to kill him? That's exactly what they talk about when they meet up again that night. I was very apprehensive about the second meeting, um, not actually meeting you again, um, but but being on the scene. I, I go back to those um, to the place during the earlier days. Um, because I just I don't know, I just wanted to put it into perspective, I suppose, and uh, uh, and um, and try to think what would have happened. Uh, how things would have turned out differently if uh, um, if I had arrested you uh, and I hadn't been shot. Um, uh, I don't know. It, perhaps I was just trying to lay ghosts. Well, I can understand that. Yeah. I can understand that in the sense that you were, you were looking for a reason, you were looking for a closure, possibly. Like, you no, know, possibly. Because if we're looking at it realistically. Both of us have, have to realise that Westwood's Road changed the course of our lives for whatever reason. When I returned to Dublin, I remember clearly, like, I didn't want to go back into the area. Right? So I went and got a job, and uh, when I was taken in, like, you know, it was like a total change in your life. One minute, like, you know, my life was moving forward in a direction where I was going to get married, hopefully have children. And the next minute I was sitting in a prison cell, facing a prison sentence. And as a result of that there, I ended up doing the 21 years in jail. And I'm sitting here now with you, and it's painful to recount that their impact. Mm. So what, what impact did it have on you, on your life, your, your thinking? The initial impact um, obviously affected my immediate family. The way I felt when I was lying there, my my first thoughts were for my wife and children. And that was obviously quite distressing. Um, but I didn't realise at that time how serious the injury was. When Ryan McCartney fled back to Ireland, he made sure his gun stayed in IRA hands. What did you do with the gun afterwards? We uh, took the guns with us. Right. Uh, we moved them out of uh, Southampton, when we came out of Southampton, and we passed them on to our IRA volunteers. 
Right. But what advice was, was that? Well, it was uh, somewhere in this country, like, you know. Yeah. You know. But the weapons were passed on to our volunteers where you were part of a unit. I know where yours ended up. That was ended up in the public street seized, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, that's where it was recovered. Ronnie McCartney may have been on the run, but the IRA bombing campaign in England was far from over. The leadership of the Republican movement believed at that very time that the war could only be won in England, mm. that it could not be won in Ireland, and that one bomb in England was worth a hundred bombs in Ireland. But I don't think the volunteers deliberately went out to kill civilians. It did happen. They would have seen soldiers in a bar, or the Gulf War and Woody, or what have you. <coughs> and they would have seen that there was a military target, a military bar. Yeah, but, but they would have known that there were civilians in there. I mean, there were civilians running the place for a start. How much training had you had before you came over? Well, I, I was involved in the IRA for about four years, five years. Right. The training for England, like, you know, was go where, do yourself isolated pick your targets mm -hmm. and proceed with the war. Right. So were you, uh, were you actually laying the devices? No, I never knew. The devices in the I have to be quite honest. Like, you know, <laughs> no, you can't see what I mean. I was there with one of those places, like, you know, in Warminster. That bombing mission took place the night before Ronnie McCartney shot Malcolm Craig. It was supposed to be a carbon copy of IRA attacks at Guildford Woolwich in Birmingham. With two others, he drove the bomb to its location and kept watch while it was put in place. The intention was to kill as many off-duty soldiers as possible. It contained 30 pounds of gelignite and a detonator, and the bombers gave no warning. The target was a pub in Warminster, a garrison town 15 miles from Southampton. Today, the pub's name has changed, but Ronnie McCartney can't change the fact that his actions could have had dreadful consequences. We saw what we thought to be branch men walking up and down the street, attacking the bars and looking out. And uh, I went with the person who was planting the bomb to cover him. And the bomb was planted on the car and said the archway there. What do you mean to cover him? To cover them in case anybody tried to apprehend them, the branch man had to try to apprehend them or anybody of that nature. And what would you have done? Probably would have shot them. How do you feel standing here years later, there are people walking up and down this street? Any of these people could have been killed by your bomb. Well obviously, thankfully the bomb didn't go off. And look at here now, really pleased that it didn't go off. Really pleased that we weren't coming back here to look at our, our, our memorial a lot of innocent people as well as British personnel. So obviously feelings are for the people. And that's how I feel. I was apprehensive about it. I felt that at that time we should have been uh, targeting the military fights, especially in Salisbury Plain. But uh, well, for whatever reason it was decided to do this here far by the person who was in charge at that time. Was it wrong to plant the bomb? I do think it was wrong. It was wrong in the fact that, you know, that was, you were supposed to be targeting military targets. You were actually targeting civilian targets as well, civilian people as well. And unfortunately, you know, it, was a, it would have been an act that would have been catastrophic for the people here in Warman. So. so if you felt that you shouldn't have been doing it, why did you go along with it? Because there was a volunteer in the IRA. On top of his three life sentences, Ronnie McCartney was also jailed for conspiracy to cause explosions. He was given a minimum recommended term of 25 years and spent almost 22 in prison. Often he'd see convicted murderers released while he remained inside. He felt he was being made an example of for taking the IRA's war to England. During his prison career he was moved 43 times, often through Southampton. My memories of this here water, this here port, has uh, been transferred to uh, Parkhurst or the other way, or the other way, or Albany. When you were going this way towards the other way, you knew you were going to a half days in prison. But when you were coming this way, you were coming from the other way, so it meant you were going to some of the confinement or a local prison. Ronnie McCartney's war continued inside prison. 
During the first ten years, he spent almost seven of them in solitary confinement. These pictures show him during a rooftop protest in Wormwood Scrubs. I was described as one of the most disruptive prisoners within the prison system. So how do you feel about the earlier part of the time that you spent in prison? Do you feel it was life wasted, time wasted? I never felt like that there, Malcolm. Like, you know, I always regarded myself like as a political prisoner, a prisoner of war. Mm. I'd be honest, I was very hard life. Mm. I was better. <coughs> and uh, I wouldn't talk to any of these prisoners for about 18 months. And my view at that time was, well, I'm not a criminal, why am I calling the criminals for? And I couldn't understand why our political prisoners were actually talking to criminals. Mm. I found it amazing, like, you know, you know, shot by an Irish person, an IRA volunteer. Mm. But there's no sense of bitterness towards the Irish, sir. I never really felt any great an animosity towards um, the Irish people as a race, simply because they were Irish. It was only the people that were committing the crimes. As far as I was concerned, they were criminals. You yourself was a criminal, in my mind. Um, uh, and that was why I was trying to arrest you. You know, I, I also accepted the fact that, certainly after the trial, that you had your own beliefs, and we happened to be on opposing sides. In 1988, when I was in, in the prison, a certain individual, I won't mention his name, came into the prison, and I had been involved in a, a bombing operation in London. And I asked him, like, why, like, you know, why that operation? I said, we need bits. I said, I started thinking, then, like, you know, what, what, what have we reduced ourselves to? He felt the IRA had reached a stalemate and in prison became a persuader for the IRA ceasefire. He remains a supporter of Sinn Féin's peace strategy but is not a party member. Ronnie McCartney was released in 1995 and although he has a first class honours degree he has gone back to his old trade of painter. He's involved in cross-community work and now believes tolerance is the key to building a peaceful future. My view is life is politics, even normally life it's politics. But I do feel like, you know, if people were to get beyond labels and get beyond misconceptions of what a person is and treat the person as a person, a human being, who has feelings, who bleeds the same blood, maybe pray to the same God or a different God regardless, like, you know. But if you can learn, learn to accept without agreeing, I think it's a way forward, like. For Ronnie McCartney, moving forward has also meant looking back. Malcolm Craig, too, has had to reflect on the past. And by meeting Ronnie McCartney, it's helped him come to terms with being left for dead. The fact that we, in effect, made friends with Ronnie and his wife, um, and we got on very well with them, it was a nice ending. So I, I hope that my dad feels a lot better, you know, about it all, and that he can move on. And or well, he has moved on, but it just sort of closes something in your mind when you confront something, doesn't it? I think it has tied up a few loose ends. Probably gone full circle we must tend to meet up with him on a dark night there and, uh, and end up with one of us lying in the gutter and then to uh, meet up some 20, 30 years later and uh, and sort of shake hands and go out for a meal again afterwards. <laughs> uh, very strange, but um, yeah, yeah, I felt quite comfortable with that. Oh, uh, uh, I feel quite comfortable with life at the present moment. Uh -huh. But that's, I think that's These men have reached an accommodation over what happened on Southampton Street 30 years ago. Between them, the issue of an apology has never been discussed. Neither man says he felt it was necessary. I don't think he said that he was sorry in so many words. Uh, he didn't say that he was remorseful about what had happened. Um, well, I think he has some regrets about the way things were done, uh, and in view of what he's doing now, I think um, he realises that there is another way of going about things, and well, let's hope he succeeds. Yeah. Does he owe you an apology? No, I don't think so. 
Well, why do you fear that? Because at that particular time we were on two different sides of the fence and I feel that he was doing something he believed in at that stage um, that he obviously wanted to stay free he didn't want to be um, put into prison um, he knew what was um, likely to happen to him if he was arrested and under the same circumstances I and most other people would have done exactly the same thing Malcolm didn't ask for an apology so I thought that was a good thing and had he have done so, what might you have said? I probably would have said, like, you know, of course I regret the fact that you were shot. I regret the fact that I've had an impact on your life. But I would have also said, like, no, I was involved in a conflict and I believe it. Reconciliation means different things to different people. Clearly, in this case, meeting up and examining the past has brought an understanding. A man who almost lost his life when the IRA brought their war to his doorstep has found some sense of peace with his would-be killer. The one-time provo and the policeman plan to meet again. In tomorrow night's spotlight, we confront one of Northern Ireland's most ruthless killers and hear from those who suffered through his actions.